So, so far this semester we've looked at a pretty wide variety of moral theories. Now, um, at this point, we're going to ask the question of, you know, does morality depend upon religion? Right? Now, this notion of dependence kind of fluctuates in this chapter. It, it, there's different notions of dependence floating around. Um, one way of thinking about whether morality depends upon religion is whether the truth of some ethical theory depends upon the truth of some religion. All right? That's one way to try to understand dependence. Another way is, uh, does our knowledge of morality depend upon our knowledge of a particular religion? Right? That's another way to think about dependence. Another way to think, think about it is, does the existence of morality depend upon the existence of a religion? Now, Rachel's... Uh, you know, looks at looks at this question, and he, he, he provides several different approaches. But sometimes it's not always clear which kind of dependence he's talking about. So we'll uh, think about that as we uh, wrap up, uh, when we wrap this up at the end. But the question we're dealing with here is trying to figure out what, if any, kind of dependence morality has upon a religion. So one of the classic arguments in dealing with this kind of dependence, or wondering what this kind of dependence is, is something called the Euthyphro Dilemma. And it's called Euthyphro, uh, named after the person with whom uh, Socrates is having a conversation about this. So um, the Euthyphro Dilemma starts off really simple. You know, he's asking the question, um, is what is moral, moral, because the gods command it, or we could just simply say the divine. If you don't want to talk about the existence of God, you could simply say it this way. Say, is what is moral moral because the divine commands it? Or does the divine command it because it's moral? So if it's the first one, right? So the, the two possibilities, either it's moral because the divine commands it or the divine commands it because it's moral. All right, so let's try the first one. It's moral because the divine commands it. Okay. So what is this supposed to mean? Well, there's a couple of different ways of trying to understand this. Right? One way that Rachel's looks at is that, um, you know, the you know we have existence, all right? We have the world. We have what's real. We have all these physical properties, and then the gods come along. The divine comes along, and then kind of adds morality on top of that. Right? Um, so you know, what uh, the divine commands makes this morality. Um, another way of understanding this uh, is that um, you know you, you have you have you know what is natural. You have what is existence. There is just no morality at all, and the God simply just commands something, or the divine simply commands something. Okay. So this whole idea is that there is some kind of disconnect between uh, what is real, what's true, and then what the what the divine says. Right. Well, now if it's this option, it looks. It looks like a bad situation here if this is the case, that if the divine makes true, uh, you know, independently of what's real, makes true what is moral. All right? uh, because it looks like there's just absolutely no reason for deciding one thing or another. Um, sure, the divine, you know, with a lot of uh, faith traditions, that the divine commands say something like murder, that murder is immoral. But if there's no reason for that, um, then we'd say, well, you know, the divine could have commanded just anything. Could have commanded murder or killing, random killing to be moral. Right. The divine could have, man could have commanded uh, you know, a variety of things regarding life. It, the divine could have commanded that it's absolutely wrong in all situations to take life, right? any life whatsoever. Uh, the divine could have commanded that um, you know, to take every life. Now, you might be thinking, like, well, that, that's just kind of nonsensical because there's good reasons to take life or not take life. And this is exactly the point. Yeah, if there's nothing that existed or is responsible for divine command, then it could have just been completely arbitrary. Uh, but you know, our gut instinct is that, well, there's really good reasons for what is moral. Right? There's really good reasons for why... Uh, you know, this or that is morally immoral. We've seen lots of varieties of, of how to explain that with these different ethical theories. Uh, and so this is exactly the point. It's like we don't think morality is arbitrary. We think that there is good reason. But if there's already good reason, independent of what the divine commands, then it can't be that option. There has to be reason for why the, demand, the divine commands what the divine commands. Like, okay. 
good, right? But then this is the second option, that the divine commands it because it is good. But if the divine commands it because it is good, it looks like it's good regardless of what the divine commands. Right? So, randomly killing strangers. There's a really good reason not to do that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that some divinity wouldn't command it. Right? Uh, you know, if divinities are anything like people, you know, there are many times when people have <laughs> commanded uh, killing others for no good reason, but that doesn't mean it's moral. Right? It looks like the standard of what is moral is independent of what the divine command is. So either way you go here, I mean, either you say that what is moral is moral because the divine commands it, then you get this weird notion that morality is arbitrary, and we don't want to accept that. The other way that we can go is to say that uh, the divine commands it because it is moral. It's like, okay, uh, we, you know, we, we like to go that way, but then it looks like what is moral is independent of divine command. So one approach in saying that, in taking this second option with the Euthyphro Dilemma, is what's called the uh, natural law theory. Now the reason why Rachel talks about this is because it's been very popular with, with some traditions to appeal to natural law theory when trying to explain why what divinity commands is, is moral. Right? And natural law theory has, has basically three claims. Right? The first is that there is a natural order to the world or even just order. <laughs> there is just an order to the world. Right? Um, and th another way of saying this is that there are patterns to what's real. Okay? Um, trees sprout from acorns. Right? Trees don't sprout from puppies. And, and vice versa. Puppies don't sprout from acorns. <laughs> um, the sky uh, is gaseous, the ground is solid and rock. Right? Um, talk about mathematics, right? There's a pattern in mathematics for what is real. Um, you know, one plus one always equals two. Two plus two always equals four. The rules of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division are constant. They don't change uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with, well, at least when you're dealing with counting integers, right? You, you don't have difference in rules. But you know, if there is going to be a difference, then there's going to be some way to account for it. If there's going to be difference in this situation, then there's going to be that same difference in all the relevantly similar dis, uh, situations. The laws, uh, you know, the, what we discovered that the physical sciences discovers a causal order to the universe. Uh, the physical sciences are going to tell us things, for instance, like, you know, puppies don't sprout from acorns and acorns don't sprout from puppies. Uh, the physical laws are also going to tell us um, uh, you know, about these causal relationships between material objects. So they're, they're going to describe the causal law, the, the physical science is going to describe how I behave. All right, they're going to give an account of the things that I can do and the things that I can't do within physical limits. All right. So that's the first claim of natural law theory is that there is a pattern, an order, a rationality to the universe, to all of reality. Right. The second part of natural law theory is that there are laws that describe how things are right? and there are laws that describe how things should be. Okay, So the causal laws of nature are going to describe how these trees are actually going to exist. Right? Trees, or these trees, well, <laughs> the oak trees sprout from acorns, the cedar trees uh, sprout from uh, whatever the seed is for cedar trees, uh, and this is the causal order of of reality, right? Not just trees, but also human beings, what we can do, what we can't do. The second kind of laws are not how things are, but how things should be, okay? So, uh, you know, we have lots of ideas about how things should be. We talk about this all the time. Um, human bodies should be healthy. We, you know, we should strive for health. Uh, human minds should be uh, emotionally and cognitively well balanced. You know, we we should be able to uh, have a grasp upon our emotional states, and we should uh, strive for believing true things. Right? Um, you know, these you know th these are uh, two different kinds of laws. There are laws for how things should be, and laws for how things actually are. And it you know, natural law theorists can say it's not exactly it's not like these things are completely separated. Right? How things should be is in part going to depend upon how things are. So one part of what we are, you know, human beings, is we in fact have minds, and um, we we do have emotions, right? So the the laws that describe uh, how we actually behave are going to have certain descriptions about 
uh, what we're going to do given certain emotional states. All right. So, uh, you know, if you're extremely, extremely angry, uh, the laws will describe that behavior. Usually it's yelling, sometimes violence, certain facial expressions. Um, it will, you know, these laws will, um, uh, you know, when, when we're dealing with anger, are probably going to explain how we react to people with whom we are angry, right? That's going to be the descriptive part. The laws that describe what should happen are going to, in part, depend upon that in the sense that, you know, given certain descriptions and how we are, uh, we should act a particular way, but that's not necessarily, the it's not going to be the same thing as actually what is, right? So, for instance, you know, how we actually act when we're angry is like where you yell at somebody and maybe we'll actually hit them, something like that. But the laws describing how we should behave will say, well, no, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't hit people necessarily when you're angry. I mean, there are going to be certain limits on when you can use violence. Um, now, you imagine that the descriptive laws are different. Imagine, like for instance, when you hit somebody, it causes damage, causes bruising, maybe you cause some bleeding, right? If you hit them hard enough, something like that. Well, you know, if the causal descriptive laws were different, right, if no amount of hitting somebody actually caused damage, then the, then the laws describing how you should behave would probably be different. Right? If there was no damage that was caused by hitting somebody, then it will probably be okay to actually hit somebody when you're angry. So, so for instance, this happens already now. When I'm angry at somebody, you know, um, you know, my anger doesn't necessarily cause damage, right? I could just be angry and keep that anger to myself, but it wouldn't necessarily hurt another person. So, if it doesn't cause that damage, then there's, you know, at least on the surface, there's nothing really wrong with whether or not I should be angry. So, you know, there are the laws that describe what actually happens, what can happen, as far as you know, physical descriptions are concerned, and there are laws about what should happen. The laws about what should happen aren't completely independent of what actually happens, right? But uh, they're not coextensive. They're not the same thing, right? There's going to be there's going to be different sets of laws, or as I like to to tell people, the difference between is and should is called the real world. <laughs> The third part of natural law theory is that, um, you know, so the first part was that there's an order, a pattern, a rationality to existence. The second part is that there are laws that describe how things actually are and uh, laws that describe how they should be, okay? The third part of natural law theory is that all of this is describable, or I'm sorry, all of this is discoverable or at least known or understood by reason, right? So the, so the idea is oh, there is this pattern, there is this rationality to the universe. This pattern, this rationality is going to give us the two different sets of laws. Since there is this rationality to the universe, we are going to understand it because we are rational creatures. We are the kinds of things that use reason. We are the kinds of things that can discover patterns. And this works really well in a, in a lot of regard because, um, you know, we are really good at discovering the causal laws of nature, you know, at least to an extent. We, we understand a lot as far as that's concerned. We're really good with, for instance, mathematics, which is another kind of pattern to reality. We're really good with logic, right? We're, uh, well, you know, to an extent, we're really good with logic. We could discover a lot of patterns and reasoning with logic. Um, you know, what we've been doing through this course, we've been discovering uh, different ideas of what is moral, right? We've been looking at reality and engaging reality with our minds and trying to figure out what is moral based upon that. Um, so these three claims are the real basis uh, for natural law theory. So Rachels provides three objections uh, to natural law theory. Now the first objection is, um, you know, what is natural is not always what is good. Right? So, uh, you, you know, you get this kind of popular refrain from uh, people who are endorsing, how shall we say, certain... Uh, plants that when either consumed or uh, the smoke of which is inhaled induces certain euphoric states, right? Uh, so the claim is, well, you know, this is natural, so it's good. You also get a lot of claims about this, say, for instance, with uh, food products, right? You say, well, this food is natural, it's naturally made, so it's good. Um, well, you know, as Rachel points out, there are lots of things that are natural, like this, that are not good, right? Arsenic occurs naturally in nature. You can literally, if you know where to look for it, you can literally go into a field and, and, and find arsenic. Right? 
you know, poisons are natural. The venom of a snake is natural. But that doesn't mean it's good, right? That doesn't mean it's good. So the, you know, the Rachel's argument here, his objection is that, you know, what is natural is not always what is good. You know, that's a good argument. Um, and it's a good object, you know, good, good, I mean, that's a true claim that what is natural in this sense is not always what is good. However, that's not the sense of natural that the natural law theorist is dealing with. Right? Uh, you know, it looks like what Rachel's is doing here is he's kind of combining the two different kinds of laws into one. Right? He seems to be saying that the causal laws of nature are just the same thing as the uh, laws about what you should do. And that's not what the natural law theorist is claiming. Natural law theorists would agree with Rachel's here that just because it's natural in the sense that it occurs in nature does not mean it's good. Right? The natural law theorists would agree with that. But the natural law theory says, I'm not talking about just that sense of natural. I've got uh, more than one sense of natural. I've got, uh, um, and when I'm talking about natural, I'm talking about what's exist what exists, what's part of the nature, the essence or definition or, uni or, or, or meaning of a thing, not necessarily what happens in a forest. Uh, so, you know, this is Rachel's first objection that what is natural in the sense that it occurs uh, independent of human intervention is not always what is good. And this is true. What is natural in this sense, in, in the sense that it occurs independent of human intervention, is not always what is good. But the natural law theorist doesn't claim this. The uh, second objection that Rachel gives is... Um, this kind of famous one, uh, that what is the case doesn't imply what ought to be the case. Um, so, so the idea is, well, there's lots of things that actually are, right? So when we're, when we're looking at it to the world, we're looking at reality, there's lots of things that actually are. I mean, there is, uh, you know, there is, there is the fact that people are dying of disease. There is the fact that people are killing each other. There is the fact that, um, oh, I don't know, um, that people lie to each other all the time. But from that fact of is, that doesn't mean that they're, that you ought to kill, that you ought to lie, that you ought to steal. And you, this is right. You know, there's all kinds of things that actually happen. Uh, that doesn't mean they ought to happen. However, <laughs> the natural law theorist is not claiming this. The natural law theorist, is, it actually makes a real distinction between this, when with the two different kinds of laws. They're the laws of what actually is, Right? The, you know, the causal laws of what actually happens and the laws of what should be. Right? Now, you know, you might say, well, hold a second, does that mean that they're independent? No, I, you know, like I said, they're not completely independent. Um, some of what should be is going to depend upon what actually is. It's like, okay. Well, that doesn't mean they're coextensive. Right? And all that is really meant here when talking about uh, laws that should be uh, with laws that are this kind of laws of existence is that uh, if you know if reality were different, the laws of what should be would also be different, and that's just I mean that's just going to cohere with all the theories that we talked about so far. Right? Uh, if there if there were no rationality, uh, we wouldn't have social contract theory or uh, Kant's respect for persons or even Rachel's bare minimum conception of morality, right, involving rationality. You know, if rationality were completely different, if we were built differently, such that, you know, right now, the way that we're built, we have to start with experiences and try to derive conclusions from that, right? So if I'm going to learn about these trees, I've got to start by observing the trees and derive the laws of nature about the trees. Now, if, we're brains, if our brains were different, if our rationality was different, such that I didn't have to go through the experiences of looking at that tree, instead, let's say my mind could make direct contact with the tree and be able to infer, or be able to just know directly everything there is to know about that tree, then I wouldn't have to bother with the scientific method. Uh, if there was that change in what was real, there would be that change as far as what rationality is. But that doesn't mean that what is rational is just coextensive with what is. Okay. There's still some dependence there. Uh, there's going to be you know, something more happening than, uh, uh, than simple uh, inference, right? Um, but uh, but it, it's not as if uh, the natural law theorist is saying that what is just is what ought to be. Now, the natural law theorist is not saying that. So again, it kind of it looks like 
you know, Rachel's complaint that is does not imply ought, that's a, that's a good complaint. Or, I mean, that's, that's true. Is does not imply ought. But the natural law theorist you know, claims exactly opposite that, that there is a difference between what is and what ought to be. Rachel's third objection is actually not, it's kind of related to the, to the first two. So the third objection uh, deals with the physical sciences. Now, with the physical sciences, we could spend all day out here observing nature, right? And we do this a lot and we do it very well. Right? So we, we do study the trees and we look at how the trees are related to the earth and the water and the sky. We look at the causal relationships between these things. And never, not once, do we find uh, laws of what ought to be. We only ever find of laws of what is. Right? So, you know, Rachel's is saying, look, you know, the physical sciences deal with what's natural all the time. But we never find these laws of what ought to be. We only ever find the laws of what are, or what is. Um, and, you know, if, if that, you know, that's, that complaint, again, is, it's kind of misguided. <laughs> again, it's, it's confusing the two kinds of laws, right? There's a lot that science, that the physical sciences don't uncover, and it's not supposed to. For instance, you know, you can study nature all you want, and you're not going to find any physical evidence for mathematics. Right? That's not how math works. We don't understand mathematics in virtue of observation and through experiment. We understand mathematics through conceptual understanding. Right? Uh, the same thing is, uh, it's, it's the same is true for a lot of things, right? There, there are plenty of properties out there that are not physical properties. Science, and this is what the physical sciences do very good, and I'm a fan of science, the physical sciences can tell you about the physical properties of all these things and about you and about uh, you know, the world and atoms and, and galaxies and you know, from the very tiny to the very big. It can describe all those physical properties. But natural law theorists say, yeah, there's physical properties and there are, and there are moral properties as well. Right? There are laws about what is and there are laws about what should be. Lots of things do this. Right? The, lots of other disciplines talk about physical they talk about other properties besides physical properties. It, you, know, you might just start discounting all these different kinds of physical properties or, or different kinds of properties, but you know, the property of being a good inference is one of those. That's not a physical property. For instance, the whole scientific method does not have physical properties. The scientific method, is a great method for discovering uh, uh, physical properties and the, rela and the relationships of the things having those physical properties between them. But it itself has no physical properties. All right? uh, what an experiment is does not rely upon any given physical thing or any kind of physical thing. Rather, what an experiment is involves all of these physical things. Right? And it itself doesn't have any physical properties. So. You know, even truth. Truth is not a physical property. You can't weigh it. You can't burn it. You can't transfer it from one object to another. You can't build it. Right? Truth itself is not a physical property. So, you know, Rachel's complaint here that the sciences deal with what's natural and they can't find any of these natural laws, again, it is confusing the two kinds of laws. The natural law theorist is very willing to say, yes, there are causal laws of nature between material objects. That's one set of laws, and that the physical sciences discovers very well. But physical sciences don't discover the, the laws that sh of what should be because they're not designed for that. And for one really simple example of what this is, all kinds of physical laws, there's going to be all kinds of physical properties about what happens to the body in different situations. Right? You give the body different kinds of food, you get different kinds of outcomes. Right? You, give the body, you have the body uh, do different kinds of activities, you get different kinds of outcomes. And the physical sciences can give us that complete description. But in that description, amongst those physical properties, you will not find the physical property healthy. Healthy is what we come along and, and in a sense, add to it. And if you don't believe me, there have been really constant descriptions of what uh, of what the physical body does, but there's been changing definitions of what is healthy. 
Um, so, uh, you know, we already engage in this kind of activity of what we should be healthy versus how we actually are. And I'm not going to go into my physical descriptions. So these three objections that Rachel's provides really just confuse the two kinds of laws that the natural theorist is dealing with. Um, now, this still leaves open the question of what this is all have, has to do with religion. Now, I don't want to give the impression that there's just absolutely nothing wrong or <laughs> uh, problematic with natural law theory. No, there's lots of problems. I mean, even just using the case of what's healthy, right? You're going to get a wide variety of answers of what's healthy. Uh, when we're talking about physical health, we're talking about emotion health, mental health, uh, even in terms of, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about happiness through the semester, right? We, you know, obviously lots of people are not happy, um, but trying to figure out what happiness is and, and you know, answering that question has been at best troublesome because we've had a lot of problems with that. It, you know, really, in a, in a lot of ways, natural law theory is a very common project. I mean, when you look at the three claims behind natural law theory, that there is an order to the universe, that there is a difference between what is and what ought to be, and that we can discover through human reason, right? That's real common to all the theories. All right. Uh, well, to at least you know, at least to, to some of them. You know, we're dealing with uh, Kant's categorical imperative, right? Definitely dealing with rationality. Definitely dealing with. Uh, the difference between what is and what ought to be, and definitely dealing with the idea that reason can discover this. Utilitarianism does the same thing, right? Uh, utilitarianism is very concerned with what's real out there. Um, you know, it gives a very clear view, or you know, it, it, it uh, demands of us that we look at what's real, and especially at the consequences of our actions, and we find happiness in all that, and we should go after happiness. So there's, a, you know, there's lots of rules about what is, and one rule about what we should do, namely go after the thing that produces the most happiness. Um, and the utilitarian is really confident that we can do this through human reason. So there's, I guess what I'm, I'm pointing out here is that there is variety of natural law theories in, in really important ways. Um, and there, you know, there are some really specific ones. I mean, one, you know, there, there's a version that just really kind of sticks to natural law theory, but the three claims behind, or is one that's just really specifically called natural law theory. Um, but the idea behind natural law theory is actually really common across the theories. Now, you know, of course, there's going to be problems with natural law theory. We've seen that just through the course of the semester and just trying to work out these three claims. Now, um, what is, you know, so we're really getting to the main point here is, you know, what does this have to do with religion? And there's even a way you can kind of parse this out. You can uh, say, oh, what does morality have to do with any given religion? And what does morality have to do with, uh, with any given, like, you know, if a deity exists, if the divine exists, right? The honest these are, are kind of two different questions, right? The fact that there are religions doesn't necessitate that anyone's got it right. Um, and, you know, if there is no deity, um, you know, it really looks like religions are in trouble, but they still make a lot of, of, a lot of claims. And, you know, the idea is, well, what are we supposed to do with that uh, if there is no divinity? Sorry. All right. So to try, to try to think about this a little bit... Um, when, you know, when we're dealing with something like natural law theory, and actually any of these different philosophical theories about what is moral, and you see you know, the motivations behind these different theories pop up across time, culture, religion, and, and place. Right? The question is, well, what, does this, what is this relationship between morality and religion? And the thing that Rachel's focuses on, and it's a really great question, is this, you know, with, with these various theories, right, um, the idea is that we can discover what's true about morality um, independent of what a religion states. Right? So that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is to say, yeah, religions make various claims about what's moral. But we have to use reason to understand why they're moral. Right? So that's another way to look at it. Um, and these, you know, these are two really important claims to consider. You know, as far as I know, 
yeah, you know, faiths in different religions, they do teach different kinds of moral codes. That's right. Now, also, as far as I know, none of them stop there. There's always an explanation for why these are the right moral commands. Uh, you know, you, of course, you can have preachers and maybe even some institutions, religious institutions, that um, will say uh, that the reason why these are true is because they're commanded by the de by the divine or by by the, by that church. Like, okay, but that's pretty few and far between. Even you know, Rachel's likes to you know use the uh, use the Catholic Church as an example, but the Catholic Church spends a lot of time trying to explain why these why these moral commands are the right ones and it doesn't always depend upon uh, simply because it pops up in a sacred text right you know as Rachel's points out um, natural law theory is a favorite of the Catholic Church in trying to explain these things but natural law theory as we saw with that discussion doesn't rely upon any specific sacred text so yeah, the, uh, these various faiths, as far as I know, these, these faiths, all of them, as far as I can tell, always offer some kind of explanation, some kind of justification for why these theories are the right ones, besides simply saying the divine commands it. So the, the, so the different faiths embrace this idea that what is moral is understood and justified by human reason. So, but this is the crux of of the complaint that Rachel has. This is the big question. If what is moral does depend, or you know, is justified and can be understood by reason, by human reason, why do we need the divine? 